Okay, good morning, everybody. I'd like to start by apologizing for having this on a Monday morning, um, and we really sincerely appreciate everybody's attendance uh, and participation uh, for those here and those on the web. We do have a pretty sizable amount of people that have uh, dialed in and are watching the presentation online. Uh, what we're going to do is at the end of this, we're going to carve out quite a bit of time for questions and comments. Uh, we'll do our best to address as many of the online questions that we have. But if we do not address everybody's question, what we'll do is we'll uh, you know, uh, compile them together and provide responses on our website uh, prior to uh, December 4th, which is the day that a lot of these major changes are going to be implemented. So I'm going to get started. Uh, my name is Jason Rondu. I manage the uh, local solar program, so responsible for the solar incentive program and the uh, feed and tariff program as well. And as many of you uh, know, uh, earlier uh, or later last year, uh, we reached out and, and had some workshops and solicited a lot of feedback from all of you. Uh, and over the past uh, eight to 10 months, we've been uh, working hard to, to get those ready uh, and to staff up in key areas. And we're getting uh, really close to uh, making those and implementing those uh, new changes. Uh, and so this is part of the process to make sure that, that we get all of you up to speed and you know exactly what to do. Um, for everybody in person here, raise your hand if you've got a project in process, some more uh, in process. OK, so what we've also uh, outlined in this presentation is what to do depending on where you're at in the process. And so we'll have that, uh, we'll briefly cover it here, but we'll post this on the web uh, so that everybody knows, no matter what project they have in any status, what they should do next, because it'll be slightly different. Um, and uh, we hope it'll be substantially faster uh, to go solar uh, under this new uh, separated process. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to spend the first uh, 20 to 30 minutes talking about uh, the changes from the incentive perspective. Uh, and then Chief ESR Alex Roberts, who's sitting over here on my right, uh, is going to come up and talk about the new uh, interconnection process, which will uh, substantially expedite the process by which uh, customers can get solar uh, and have it energized in a very quick uh, fashion. And then we'll carve out the, the remaining time for questions and comments for both the web and everybody on uh, everybody here in person. So that's some quick, very, very quick background about DWP and our energy mix going forward. Uh, many of you know that we're going to be 50% re renewable by 2030. And a big piece of that is getting off of coal. And a big piece of renewables is going to be solar. And so this is a breakdown of what solar is projected to look like uh, over the next 20 or so years. This could look uh, different uh, in the future, obviously, but this is what we're projecting at this point. Uh, and you can see at the very top is the very large scale uh, uh, typical solar you see out in the desert. And then we've got a community solar program of about 40 megawatts, a little bit relatively small compared to some of the customer programs we have, uh, like the feed and tariff program. As many of you know, we have about 150 megawatts approved already, and we're in the process of developing an expanded program for that. And then customer net metered, uh, driven largely by the solar incentive program, uh, it makes up 310 megawatts uh, that we expect to have that built out by 2017-2018 uh, timeframe. Uh, so quick summary of uh, the solar incentive program to date, we have almost 150 megawatts of customer-owned generation uh, that many of you have worked uh, very hard on to sell those projects, build those projects, and get those interconnected. Uh, we've invested over $200 million to date uh, in just this iteration of the incentive program, just the Senate Bill 1 iteration of the program. To date, we have nearly $30 million of residential incentives uh, remaining that we project will uh, cover uh, will uh, last through the end of 2016. Commercial funding is down to $2 million. Uh, and for everybody here that tracks this closely, you know that that wavers between uh, one and a uh, few million. And really, the reason is we see a lot more project drop out on the commercial side uh, than we do on the residential side. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of what our participation rates are on a weekly basis. This yellow line, the two yellow vertical lines, 
uh, just indicate when January is so you can kind of notice the seasonality of this. And on the rightmost side is our latest year. This is 2015. And you can see that we've had a, a major, major spike. And that's when the, the incentive level drops. So everybody was rushing in to try to get the, uh, the residential, uh, higher residential incentive. And we saw, see a little dip off. But overall, really, the takeaway here is uh, for about a year and a half, we saw about 100 applications per week. That's residential and commercial, but of course, most of those were residential. And that grew to about 150 over the last several months. And so we're seeing a sustained higher participation rate, uh, which is great uh, because we get, obviously, quite a bit more solar on our system, and it helps us meet the goals that I had talked about uh, earlier. Uh, this is a month-by-month -month snapshot of the processing times. And this is, again, for the old process, the current process that we have uh, now. So the very bottom uh, slice is the time it takes to get a reservation. So everybody knows you ask for money, we review the application, and then we confirm that money is available and that you're eligible. And that second slice is the inspection time. So the time that it takes to set a meter for a typical residential uh, customer, uh, on average, it's about four weeks, and then payment ranges from about eight weeks to uh, 12 weeks. A lot of you will remember, if you rewind to uh, early 2014, uh, we had pretty substantial um, uh, wait times for uh, reservations uh, and, in some cases, for inspections. And as you can see, that even with the growth of participation, which is this uh, line here, even with this growth of participation, um, we've been able to um, yeah, help mitigate against any uh, delays like we had seen in the past. Uh, and so that's something that we're really proud of. But we also want to talk about some of the steps that we're taking going forward to, to further improve our processes. Uh, so just to recap, we did uh, outreach uh, last year. Late last year, we solicited a lot of feedback, and then we uh, began work on staffing the key groups and on uh, making the major programmatic changes. So this includes changes to Power Clerk, the system that you use to go through incentives, and building a system that will manage the interconnection process as well. And, and building a team that will handle this uh, dedicated uh, for the uh, in, uh, interconnection part. And Alex will go into more detail about that in a moment. So some recent changes. Uh, we increased uh, processing and inspection staffing. Uh, we entered into a contract to support the processing through the end of the solar incentive program. And what this does is it allows us to partner with uh, pr a third party and uh, help mitigate against any delays caused by quick ramps. If we see a big ramp early in 2016, we'll have the capacity to help make sure that wait times do not grow uh, substantially. This third bullet down is uh, pretty important for many of you. Uh, many of you uh, have heard the phrase meter relief or no meter release, which is probably one of the most unpleasant things for uh, everybody here and on, on the web to hear, because what that means is you've received a permit final for a system, um, but the uh, official notification has not been transmitted to LADWP. And so it's been a, a frustrating point for us and a very frustrating point for, for all of you, but we've worked closely with LADBS uh, with the help of uh, Alex and several others on the engineering side to help create an interface so that as soon as a uh, permit final is made, we're notified instantaneously uh, and uh, we're going to cut out a substantial amount of all, all, uh, all of the meter releases. So a lot of you have probably seen a lot of those get cleared up. We do have some that we're still uh, resolving, but going forward, this is going to be a major, major improvement. Uh, the second to last bullet is on uh, removal of the performance meter requirement. So a lot of you realized uh, last year or last month that we uh, removed that requirement. Uh, for anybody that uh, still has any uh, meter sockets, uh, as you, you may know, but if you don't know, we'll just cover that meter socket or you may uh, remove it if you'd like. Uh, and that is for below 10K. It doesn't say that on here, and we should clarify that's below 10 kilowatt systems. So any system 10 kilowatts and above, uh, AC, CEC will remove require a performance meter socket that we and we will furnish the performance meter for it. And then we secured uh, board approval for the major changes, uh, which I'll go through right now. So the first major change is the separation of the interconnection and incentive processes. As you know, it's a linear process. You ask for incentives, you build your system, and then you ask for a meter, 
and you ask for your incentive, and it's all sequential. And so what we're doing is we're separating it, uh, and so you'll be able to submit minimal paperwork to seek the interconnection, and if you're delayed on getting signatures for any of the incentive paperwork, that's fine. You can still proceed and get that system completely turned on uh, before you uh, finalize the incentive uh, part. Uh, on the incentive side, for all residential non-new construction projects, uh, reservations will be instantaneous. So when you upload all the documentation that you do now, um, the difference will be when you click submit, you'll get an instant reservation, uh, and uh, that'll be notification that we saved money for that project and provided that project is eligible and consistent with our program guidelines, uh, that money will be um, uh, reserved for them. So we won't do that for commercial and new construction uh, applications, and the, the primary reason there is there's quite a substantial money at stake in some cases for uh, commercial projects, uh, and so we have seen some cases where people have applied and they were not eligible. And so we don't want to give an instantaneous uh, reservation of you know, several uh, hundred thousand dollars and then find out later that they are actually not eligible, so we're trying to prevent that. Uh, and then same thing for new construction, it's also very similar in many cases, uh, they may not be eligible for an incentive. Uh, the, fourth, uh, the third bullet down, uh, many of you, many of you uh, here know that several years ago we did not allow uh, even leases. So only purchase systems where the homeowner and the system owner own the system uh, was allowed and was uh, permitted in LADWP service territory. And a few uh, years ago we uh, updated that and we started allowing leases provided they um, met uh, certain criteria. Uh, up until recently, it was not permitted if you owned a home and you went solar and somebody came in and rented it, technically that wasn't allowed. And so what we've done is we've updated um, our policies to make it clear that tenants can participate in net metering and in some cases the solar incentive program. Uh, and the last bullet here is uh, on the commercial side, as you saw earlier, there's about $2 million remaining of uh, commercial funds. And so for the, the money that we project will be left over at the end of 2016, we're going to be allowing commercial to access that funding um, with a cap of $12 million, but we'll, per, we'll put in a, a limit that would make sure that uh, residential funding is um, – uh, protected for uh, the duration of 2016. And so what this will allow us to do is get a little bit more megawatts potentially uh, before the end of 2016, uh, and then again we'll ensure that adequate funding is uh, uh, preserved for residential, uh, uh, the residential sector. Uh, I'm not going to go through this existing process, um, it's listed here, but everybody knows, everybody here knows that it's a Again, it's a linear process, and you do have to wait several weeks sometimes uh, to just get a notification from us that we save money for you. Uh, meanwhile, many of you have already built the system, you've already permitted it, and you're still in the, the process of uh, figuring out all the paperwork. Uh, it leads to quite a bit of frustration uh, for you. You're trying to close out the project and for customers who want to get energized very quickly. Uh, and so we're separating this, and basically, I'm not going to go into this detail yet because Alex is going to walk you through, but I'm just going to focus on the incentive side. So on the left side of this image is the track for the incentive, and on the right side is the track for uh, the interconnection process. And so the key difference in the new incentive process is the very first thing that you will do is you'll go on to the interconnection request form, which is an online request form, and you'll submit a request for interconnection. You'll instantaneously get a work request number. It's a unique number that identifies your project. And when you submit your uh, incentive application on PowerClerk, you'll plug that in. And I'll show you what a screenshot of that looks like in a little bit. The other key difference here is this circled block on the bottom left, meter installed. You'll see that that happens before the incentive payment claim request is submitted. So you will get the system energized, get a meter, and have it uh, ready to go prior to uh, finalizing all the incentive paperwork, which, as many of you know, takes quite a bit of time sometimes. Uh, so a few uh, notes here. Uh, at the very bottom, a key note is so we have separated this out into a parallel track, but we don't want you know, two, three years later somebody coming back and saying, hey, I'd like to get an incentive now. What we'd like to do is within 90 days of getting your meter installed, you submit your incentive payment claim form. 
Uh, so one of the biggest challenges that, that we and everybody here will have is how do we handle the well over 2,500 uh, projects that are currently in process uh, anywhere from reservation request all the way through inspection requested. Uh, and, and many of you probably have several incomplete statuses that you're uh, in the process of uh, um, submitting uh, in Power Clerk and we'll tell you how to how to proceed with those. Uh, so to help support this transition, uh, we may temporarily suspend the program uh, the week of November 30th through uh, the 3rd, and then on the 4th we'll cut over uh, and then allow everybody to uh, go through the interconnection uh, track at that time. Nobody will need to reapply, uh, and what you'll need to do is just follow this transition plan uh, and um, make sure that your pro uh, project proceeds uh, uh, as it should. Uh, so I'm not going to cover all of these. This is for your reference. We're going to publish it on our website. Uh, if you, I'm just going to run through this real quickly for the incomplete statuses. What you'll need to do is go on the interconnection portal that Alex will talk to you about and then get your work request number because you'll need that before you submit that incomplete um, uh, project. That incomplete project, even if you've already built out that incomplete project, when you do submit it starting on the 4th, it will be an instantaneous reservation for uh, residential. You don't need to go back and rebuild uh, that application. If you do have an incomplete one, that will be instantaneously reserved. Uh, for the following uh, uh, power clerk statuses, these are all statuses somewhere in the reservation stage. This is where we manually review and uh, reserve money for everybody. Uh, all of these applications uh, will be instantly uh, confirmed. It'll be moved to confirm reservation. Um, so nobody, you know, what we want to do here is we want to make sure that people uh, don't want to reapply because they don't want to wait, you know, two weeks uh, for these to get resolved and they start over. So what we're going to do is we're going to instantaneously confirm all of these uh, and then we'll send notifications to everybody so they can uh, see a confirmation of that happening. And again, that will happen on uh, the 4th. For everybody in confirmed reservation status, so you're building your system, you're getting it permitted, you're not coming back to Power Clerk until you've got the system energized. So you don't have to deal with any of the incentive paperwork until that system is energized. Alex, again, will walk you through how to do that. Uh, and in short, what you'll do is you'll contact the Connection Center, let them know that you're ready, uh, and they'll see that you have a permit final and a meter release, and they'll request the meter to be installed. And then at that time, you go back on Power Clerk and say, I'd like to um, submit a request for the incentives. Um, for everything past confirm reservation, it's going to flow very much like it does today. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these details, but basically, if you're suspended, you'll still need to resolve that. If you're already in the inspection requested status, we're just going to move all of those through. You do not need to reapply. You do not need to contact the Connection Center. Those will all be flushed out over the, the next couple weeks, or the, the couple weeks following the 4th of December. Uh, and for everybody that may be an ESR hold, they will need to uh, resolve that, of course, before it moves forward. And uh, finally, these last few stages, uh, again, no action necessary on any of these, any different from what you do today. Again, with any suspended status, you'd need to resolve that, and then it'll proceed as normal as well. So again, nobody should plan to reapply. Um, if there's any cases here that maybe we didn't think through or maybe we didn't think of, please let us know and, and definitely ask any questions on this transition plan. This is going to be the key to making sure that your projects flow through smoothly during this transitional period. Uh, just a quick note on what we term the no incentive process. We get probably a handful single digit applications per month of projects that just aren't eligible for the incentive for whatever reason. Uh, and so what we're going to be doing is suspending that starting on the 23rd of uh, uh, November, and then that will reopen on the 4th of December. If anybody here has a project that is not seeking an incentive and you've already submitted an application to us for that, you do not need to do anything. That project will move forward, uh, and even when we suspend that program, we're, we'll, that, that project will still be proceeding. Um, we just won't be allowing for a two-week period new no incentive applications. Uh, but again, on the 4th, you'll be able to instantly uh, submit that request uh, on the 4th of December. So this is going to be the, the 
one of the few variations of what you'll see in Power Clerk. Um, this screen is familiar to many of you, uh, and you'll see a new box here that says interconnection work request number. And so what that is is the number that you'll get from the interconnection portal. Uh, if you don't have it and you get to the stage, there's a link here to say, look it up. You can look it up by address. Um, and if you don't have it yet, you can go to, there's another link down here for submitting an application for a work, work request number, and you'll be able to secure it, and then you can come back here and plug that in and then submit your application. But it's, it's critical that the interconnection process happens first because we want to make sure that we get the ball rolling on that as soon as we possibly can. Again, to, before you go through the interconnection process, you do not need to complete the uh, incentive paperwork. Uh, this is for your reference, so there's a few fewer documents that you will need to submit as part of the uh, incentive process because a lot of the interconnection related uh, uh, documentation is being stripped out of that. And for anybody that recently joined, uh, this will be recorded. We will upload this on our website uh, and the presentation will be available on our, our website for um, viewing at a later date. And so I just for anybody that's curious, we've had several questions on this. For anybody that's uh, curious about the different organizations within LADWP that are responsible for some piece of solar, I've listed it here. Alex Roberts, who's going to talk to you in a few minutes, uh, is representing the Power System Engineering Division. So they're responsible, as many of you know, for a lot of the larger interconnections uh, where an engineer is required to design the interconnection. Uh, they're going to be responsible for administering all of the interconnection process. Uh, and uh, for those projects that will require an electric service representative, they, uh, that will be managed through uh, Power System Engineering as well. Uh, our Power System Transmission and Distribution Division, uh, there's a group uh, within that division that handles installing net meters, and so that's what they're responsible for. On this third bullet down is our Planning Division and our Efficiency Solutions Group. Uh, together, we are responsible for uh, the administration and the processing of the incentive uh, program. And uh, finally, we've got our customer service division represented, and those are the folks that you uh, talk to when, uh, if you have a billing question, if you've got a billing problem that you need to resolve, or when you're calling to find out what the status is of your uh, incentive application. Uh, this is, again, some contact information. Nothing uh, is changing here except you'll see that there's a new website, ladwp.com forward slash NEM for net energy metering, and so that will be where you go to uh, to secure your interconnection work request number. Right below that is a website, find the right person, where you can look up who the engineer or ESR or the pro appropriate contact people are for, uh, for your project. Uh, so going forward, uh, today is the contractor briefing. Uh, we're going to respond to questions uh, in a uh, couple weeks' time. So again, if we do not get to everybody's question, especially those uh, that are on the web, if we do not get to every question, uh, we'll publish uh, responses to those questions uh, prior to December 4th so that you know how to handle any of your in-process applications. And then on December 4th, we'll be going live. Um, that's all I have for the incentive uh, process at, at this time. Alex, uh, would you like to continue the interconnection process? Sure. Yep, great. And again, you can ask questions on all of this at the at the end, so you'll have uh, ample opportunity at that time. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Happy Monday. To here, I'm uh, going to talk to you about the interconnection process, as Jason so aptly put it. First of all, let's go to the first slide. But before I do that. Murphy's Law, before you do something, you have to do something else first. I want to make sure that this web page comes up properly because it, when I did this this morning, it took five minutes to load. <laughs> By the way, here it is. Wow, that's much faster. Thank you. Now, this, this page here, this is the heart of it all, and this, uh, this is one you want to write down. It's www.ladwp.com forward slash NEM. And I probably don't have to define it for this group, but NEM is net energy meter. So this is how you get one of those. It all starts with this web page. All right, so slide one. Let's go back. There we go. Okay, my name is Alex Roberts, Chief Electric Service Representative. 
which uh, I think is one of the worst civil service titles ever, because every time I say it, I have to define what it is. Electric service representative is basically inspector or service planner. And today we're going to talk about how this process, how it was at one time, it still is, one long linear process that can take several months, sometimes up to six months. And now what we've done is we've broken it apart into two separate paths, the interconnection path and the incentive path. So you have two paths that are working in parallel and are much shorter. And this means that you could get your oh, net meter substantially quicker than the current process. Okay, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, First of all, what the new separated streamlined process is about, and also next, the fast track solar process, what the heck is that? Uh, by the way, we borrowed heavily from San Diego Gas and Electric. Their process uh, for fast track is, involves the upload of files, pictures, and your interconnection agreement. Next, the standard solar process, what is that? Next, uh, larger systems, what do you do when the system is over 30 kW? if it's a multi-unit building or it's a large track. There's a different process. So there's three different processes, fast track, standard, large. Then, <clears throat> then we'll get to that web page, NEM page, for ordering your net meter. Uh, benefits the new process, summary and question and answer. I would ask that you try to hold your questions, please, to the very end. I know you'll have a lot of questions about this, but I think I'll answer most of them as I plow through this. Okay. All right. The new separated process, uh, as I said, it's it's instead of one linear process, now you've got two things that can work in parallel. That means that everything can happen sooner. The installations can proceed entirely independent of the incentive process, which is very much like what we have now with our EV process. If any of you are familiar with that, the installation for the EV meter takes place entirely separate from the EV incentive process. So this is the same kind of thing. It worked very well. We have very few complaints, hardly any, about that process. And so we figured we would just build on success and do the same sort of thing. So the PV systems uh, can uh, happen much sooner. And as Jason said, for anything that is below 10 kW, you no longer need a performance meter. Now, at the, at the bottom there, it says meter installations will occur up to 60 to 80 percent faster than the current process, which sounds a lot like the weasel words that your cable company will use. But up to 20 percent, or up to 20 megabytes per second, um, we really mean this. This is going to be a lot faster. Uh, initially, it, it won't be as fast uh, as the new system goes online. We have to work some of the kinks out. Plus, our staffing is in the process of being increased. Our, our general manager is all about customer service, and, and they have thankfully granted us more staff, and they're in the process of being hired and trained. So in 2016, we anticipate it is possible to go from six months to get your net meter to down to one month. Now, that won't happen immediately at December 4th, but uh, when we get rolling into the beginning of the new year, we'll have more employees and a faster and faster system as we, we work all the kinks out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Yes, we're, we're really, you know, we've, we've listened to the complaints and the criticisms about the, the length of time, and, and we really do want to, to fix this and, and make this better for the customer, better for all you solar contractors, and better for our DWP's reputation <laughs> as well. So the fast track process, uh, what is that? Well, it, it looks like this. If, you're, if your PV system looks like this, in other words, it's a garden variety PV system that is um, AC, CEC output is below 10 kW, there's no performance meter. There's just a utility disconnect switch, and you're plugging it into the existing service. You don't need to upgrade or modify it. There's no uh, battery backup system. There's no additional cogeneration or anything like that. Then it's a fast track. And, and this one, uh, the ESR, electric service representative, is not involved in most cases. We are just going to review it based on the files that you upload, the pictures of the job, the interconnection agreement, do some research, and then we will 
will just move the job forward without having to go out there and do a meter spot on every single one of these. That was the original plan, and uh, there was some um, feedback about that maybe slowing the process down. So what we're doing is something like what San Diego Gas and Electric does. They look at pictures of the job that you will upload, and based on that assessment, we don't ne necessarily have to send an employee out to the job site. So the fast track criteria, so as I said, AC output of the inverter is less than 10 kW. There's no additional cogeneration facilities uh, that are there or will be there in the near future. No standby generation system is or will be connected to the customer service. The existing service panel will not be modified or upgraded. No battery backup system is or will be installed, and this is not a multi-unit building. So with all of these things, it's a fast track, which we think is about 70% of the systems that are installed out there, roughly. So the steps for the fast track uh, go like this. It's in basically five steps. Complete the net meter application process at ladwp.com forward slash NEM, the one that I showed you earlier. You upload your interconnection agreement and photos of the customer's electric service. And uh, what, it, what it doesn't say here is uh, the ESR will review those files and uh, someone else will review the interconnection agreement. When both of those things have been reviewed and approved, there'll be an automatic email that goes back to the requester that says, you can go ahead and build that system. Okay, so then, then you just build the system, then you get a building and safety release. There's no ESR inspection, just building and safety only. As soon as that comes across through the web-based system, which has just been, as Jason said, recently improved, uh, this will automatically kick out an order to our construction crews. And the longest turnaround time now in the process is it's approximately four to six weeks from the time what we, what we call a field order is issued out to the construction crew to the finally, when they get there. This will improve in 2016. Again, they're, they're staffing up on that side as well and we anticipate that to happen in, it, in as little as two weeks in the future, in the near future, I would say in four to six months. Uh, but for now, it's taking about four to six weeks for, for the meter turnaround time once that order goes out. So they go out and install the meter and then they will grant the permission to operate or PTO. Okay, there are some files that are uploaded during the application process online. And by the way, you don't have to follow this process if you're not, you have the, the uh, wherewithal to take all the pictures that we're asking for. You can opt for the standard process, which I'll describe in a minute. But this, is the, this one will save you time if you have digital photos of the job site before the PV system is built. So you would upload a completed and signed interconnection agreement. It's a one-page deal for anything under 30 kW. A close-up photo of the meter with the meter numbers clearly visible. A wide-angle shot of the service and building, including the roof, if, if possible. And for overhead services, we would like a photo of the service riser above the roof showing the attachment and weatherhead wires. The reason for that is that, that there are many times our service drop is old, deteriorated, falling apart. That's one of the reasons why we normally go out to a job to look at it, to, to check the condition that the, the attachment isn't broken, that the insulation isn't falling off, and that, that it's safe. So if the thing is serviceable, it looks nice, and there's nice weatherproof connectors at the weatherhead, we'll say, fine, we'll move on, and uh, we will uh, give you the go-ahead to start installing without us having to go there. Okay, the standard process, what is that? Standard process is basically the opposite of the, the thing I just described. So the, the AC output of the inverter is uh, 10 to 30 K, kW. In a moment, we'll get to what to do with larger than 30 kW or large multi-unit projects. Um, there are going, or there could be additional cogeneration facilities that are, will be connected to the customer service, a standby generator, you have to upgrade the panel or modify it in some way. There's a battery backup system involved in the mix. And uh, once again, this is not a, this has got to be a single occupancy building. It's a multi-unit, then it's going to be the larger process. We need plans for those. I'll get to that in a moment. That's a standard job, 10 to 30, and you're usually going to do an upgrade. And by the way, you don't 
any longer have to go to that separate web page. I don't, I'm sure you know the one that when you have to do a, an upgrade of your panel, you have to go to this other web page and fill out a uh, separate form. You won't have to do that. That's all included in this. So that if you need a meter spot, it's simply a checkbox. I need a meter spot. And this brings it into the standard process. Okay, standard process, just to summarize, the, the first two steps are the, the same. Except for the second step, you'll notice it's no longer pictures because we're going to go the, to the job. We really don't need the pictures, but we do need a single line drawing of the PV system. The ESR will provide a service equipment spot or a meter spot, as we call it, and assess the LEGWP's distribution system. Once that's done, and it's not said here, but there's an email that goes out that notifies you we've spotted the service, that you're, you're good to go. Your, in, your interconnection agreement has been approved, and we've reviewed the site, and everything's fine. And then you install the PV system, then obtain a clearance from the Department of Building and Safety, and in this case, also a clearance from the ESR. They need to inspect it. The LADWP crew will then install the net meter, and then they will do that to give you the permission to operate the system. Okay, that's the standard process. So in the case, if you take the path of the standard process, it's a, once again, signed interconnection agreement, uploaded PDF, a single line diagram which ac accurately represents the service panel, utility disconnect, the inverter model number, performance meter, solar panels, battery backup system, or additional generators if applicable. All right, this is that uh, slide that Jason showed you a little sooner. I'm not sure if this is legible because some of that font is a little tiny. But it all starts with this web page up here, the NEM web page right here. You will start there, and then that you will get within 20 minutes. Now, Jason said instantaneous, almost instantaneous. You'll get it within within the hour. You'll get an email that has your work request number and a bunch of instructions and what to expect if it's fast track or it's standard or whatever. And it'll also uh, give you a way of tracking the progress online. There's a website we have. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, it allows you to check the status. There's a there's a bar chart and uh, the major milestones are listed in the dates, so you can see what's going on with your job. So basically, you have the decision here, is this, is this below 10 kW or is it 10 kW and above? If it's yes, then standard. There's a service panel upgrade involved. The answer is yes, then that's standard. If it's no, then it's going to be fast track. Battery backup system, same thing, yes, standard, no fast track. So based on the files that are uploaded, the ESR reviews those, then the interconnection agreement is reviewed and completed. And uh, assuming everything's okay, then there's no delays. Could be delays. If there's a problem with the interconnection agreement, we'll have to send it back and get that redone. Or if there's a problem with the site, we'll let you know that, hey, you know, that, that weatherhead is, is going to fall over, cause some problems. We'll have to let you know that we'll have to go out there and look at it. The contractor builds the system, and again, building and safety. So this represents the fast track over here, standard over here. Now there's emails that go out all during this process. At the beginning, there's an email. When the interconnection agreement is approved, there's an email. When we send an order out to the crew, there's another email. And it's important for these auto reply emails, part of our general manager's directive to us is to improve the service level and keep customers in the loop. So part of this is when you fill out your online form for the net meter, we ask for the customer's contact information and email address along with the contractor's contact info. This is so those emails keep flowing out to let everybody know what's happening as the job progresses. So interconnection agreement, there's an email. Uh, when the, the meter's installed, there's another email saying that, uh, that this is good to go you now have uh, power to the PV system. It's conceivable that this whole process, depending upon, in the, in the case of fast track, start to finish, end to end, possibly one month eventually, uh, depending upon how soon the PV system is installed. Okay, what to do if the system's over 30 kW, or if it's a multi-unit building, or it's a track. For that, you would not use this online system. For those situations, we're going to ask for plans, 
plan submitted to service planning, the local service planning office, if you know what that is, uh, how to find that, those instructions are online on our website. Uh, we also have a phone number, an agent can assist. Uh, we call this the Connection Center. This, this is service planning's little call center that we have. The number for that is 213 Empower. You can also send an email to solar coordinator at ladwp.com. Uh, that is uh, if you want to send the plans in digitally. Okay, so for what we're going to need in the case of a large system, multi-unit or 30 kW or larger is a, a single line diagram, uh, a site plan, an electrical load schedule for all the uh, affected services, the ones that you're connecting to. By the way, it takes approximately two months for a long form interconnection. Anything that's 30 kW and above, I'm sure some of you, most of you are familiar with the long form interconnection agreement. That, that's a much bigger deal and there's a lot more red tape involved and that takes a couple of months. A single line diagram, site plan, electrical load schedule. Uh, for, for anything that's going to require system upgrades or our, a service planning engineer to be involved, it's at least eight weeks to process the plans system upgrades are necessary. Uh, if they aren't upgrade, uh, we will review this. The lead ESR who's going to be handling this. By the way, the people that are going to be doing the processing and inspections, the ESRs, they're, they're called lead ESRs. They're a step above. We have sort of our best people that we hired. It's separate from the group of lead ESRs that you've been dealing with who are doing 10 other things. These lead ESRs are dedicated they're newly hired, we're expanding our group, they're dedicated only to solar. And they will be reviewing these plans. And if it's not necessary for an engineer to be involved then, and there's no system upgrades, then it'll be a shorter process. If we have to do some uh, new work on the system like new transformers or new underground system to accommodate the PV system or associated with that work, eight weeks to process the plans. Um, some systems that are below 30 kW may require engineering and plan review, which will put them in the long process, even though it may be a, long, a smaller job. For example, if it's connected to uh, a station downtown, it's a three-phase system. So an engineer needs to review that, even if it's a small job. Okay, the net meter request system. It is a simple use, simple to use online form that is similar to the AMS. And what is that? It's an automated meter spot. It's the pithy term that we came up with uh, years ago. We've had this operating for years. We do this with a single family residential service request to get a, a location. If you're going to upgrade your panel, we say, here's where it goes. So that system is we're, we're building again on the success of that one because it, 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 it does work fairly quickly. So you have, at one point, the ability to upload your interconnection agreement, your photos, and as I said, auto-reply emails. All right, let me go to that website, which I think is now loaded. Oh, it expired. Oops. All right, there it is. Uh, basically, this it, when you go to this page, it, whoops. There we go. This page here just explains everything that I've just been explaining. It's the same sort of thing. It, it explains what a fast track is, what a standard process job looks like, and some other important information. So before you go to the next page, it asks you to agree that you have read the instructions, that you understand this. I know that there's going to be some people who are just going to blow right through this and hit, yeah, I agree, and, and maybe not read the instructions. Hopefully that's not anyone here, that you'll understand that this is what this is for. This is uh, for PV systems only. Um, I'm sure we'll get some apartment unit requests on here that happens or a request for a water meter or something. Here it says, I, I have read and understand the instructions above and wish to proceed with the new solar installation process. Hit next. Here you're just agreeing that this is uh, below 30 kW and it's not a multi-unit building and it's not a housing track. Just click agree. If not, could cancel or go back. Once you uh, click that checkbox, hit next. Then there's that graphic again. Uh, 
basically this is your fast track. I, agree, I certify that the single line drawing, that my job looks like that. that. I'm installing one of those. The AC output is below 10 and all the other things I mentioned earlier. And it tells you right here that you're going to need these files. So if you don't have those, probably a good idea to stop here and get them for the uh, standard process. You have, you know, it's a radio button, so you can click one or the other, decide which one you want to take. So for this, for this one, I'm going to say fast track. Now, notice down here, just say submitting in, in, inaccurate or incomplete information will result, result in delays in service. None of us wants that. So make sure that the photos, the information that we ask for is accurate, complete. Hit next. And then it tells you here, well, well, these are the files that you need to have ready. And then you say, yes, I have those ready. I'm ready to go. I have a close-up photo of the meter with the meter numbers clearly visible. I have a wide-angle shot of the service panel and the building, including the roof, if practical. And for overhead services, a photo of the service riser, attachment, and weatherhead. I have those things. I'm going to hit next. And here I go to the place where I actually upload them. So I can hit browse. I go to my desktop here. Where are my files? They were here a minute ago. This side. There I am. Okay. Okay, I'm going to upload this interconnection agreement right here. Okay. All right, I'm going to upload a photo or two. One more. I got to do at least two pictures here. Check these boxes. Notice it has another place down here for additional interconnection agreement. This is for rental units. Now, we do allow uh, interconnection agreements uh, with uh, for rental property. You need an interconnection agreement from both the tenant and the landlord, property owner. So that's what this is for. All right, so I hit next. And here's this form, which looks probably eerily familiar to you if you use the AMS system. I won't take the time to fill it out here, but it, it does ask for the usual information. But notice here that it also asks for contractor and owner or tenant contact information here. Ask you if this is an overhead service or not, or if it's underground. Ask you some other questions like, is this an existing service, yes or no, or is this a brand new building? If it's an existing service, you would hit um, yes, no, if it's a brand new building. Lock gates, dogs, battery backup system, yes or no, and so on. And then you hit next, and you'll be presented with a page where you can review the information you just put in. And then you hit submit. A 20 minutes later, you'll get an email with your work request number. And that gets the ball rolling. Initially, we're, we're, we're saying it's going to take approximately one week for the review of the interconnection agreement, possibly two weeks. Uh, in the very beginning of the process, as we're dealing with the backlog of in-flight work requests, in-flight jobs, as we get that whittled down, that we are expecting that that turnaround time is going to be in the neighborhood of five business days, from the time that this is filled out to the time that the interconnection agreement is approved. Okay, so let's uh, let's go back. Let's pretend I'm doing a uh, standard process. And I'm going to, yep, I read the instructions. I know what to do. Yep, it's under 30. I'm not doing a housing track. OK, this time I'm going to hit uh, standard process. Next. And then here it says that the page is presented to you. That it says, are you ready with these items? We're going to need the single line diagram, and we're going to need interconnection agreement at next. And here you have the file upload for those two things. And again, an extra interconnection agreement if there is a tenant involved in the mix, if this is rental property. Okay. So that is it in a nutshell. Um, benefits of the new process. 
PV system installation can begin as soon as the interconnection agreement is approved. A single point of contact or coordinator for the installation process. Unlike what you've had in the past where you have one person, you have an ESR to spot the service panel upgrade, then you have another ESR working on the inspection if the job was over 10 kW, and then you have uh, another person who would coordinate the electric vehicle installation. You have three or four people in the mix, and we had a coordination problem. Here you're going to have just one point of contact one person who can help you through the whole process from end to end. And there's going to be just one work request. We had a problem before with multiple requests. We had a, a work request for the panel upgrade, which would be one kind of meter, and another work request for the net meter, uh, yet another for the unit meter. And some of these were getting um, different organizations stepping on each other to try to get that process. Here, you're just going to have one work request for the net meter, one point of contact. Automated status notifications to the parties to let them know what's going on. And improved internal coordination of all the meter orders for the PV system, the thing I just said. Okay. There are some other things that are happening that I should let you know about in December also. Uh, listening to some of the feedback from the industry about the electric service requirements manual, that is our code book. Uh, and some of the things there really seriously needed to be updated for the new technology for solar. Uh, it is not practical for our electric trouble crews to go out and lock out every single PV system that's out there if they want to do work on a high voltage system. Um, so that they're basically saying, forget about it. We're not going to go out there and lock out these systems if they're below 100 kW. So that's, that is way over 95% of the systems out there. They're not locking out anymore. So. That means that the 24-7 rigid access requirement that we had before for any cogeneration system is not going to be there anymore. It's just going to be what we consider readily accessible. So that means that it would be uh, like, say, in a, in a meter room or something. We don't have to have all the switches on the outside anymore. If it's a residence, we wouldn't uh, have the customer cut a hole in their wall to make a gate because that's the only way in. Um, it's, it's just readily accessible. As long as we can get to the meter, that, that's good enough. The load monitoring equipment that, that was not allowed before will be allowed up to a certain uh, amount when you have a unit meter. Before, we wouldn't allow any connection of any load monitoring equipment between the inverter and the performance meter at all, zero. Um, now it's allowed up to a certain point or will be. Uh, if there's no unit meter, it doesn't matter. Uh, and the viewable window disconnect, that, that's the one with a little plastic window on it that we were requiring for class 320 systems and all commercial. Uh, that's no longer going to be required. That, that's out the window because we found that the crews were opening those covers anyway, the looking inside, and those windows tend to fog up over time so they become useless. So that that's just some, some good news, I think, for the installers that, that, that it will be uh, – less expensive, not only because of this, but you don't have to buy a meter socket anymore for the unit meter. Okay, just to summarize, the new net meter processes will greatly speed up the meter installation times by up to 80% 2016. The new pr process will greatly reduce complaints about untimely responses, poor coordination, and installation requirements. Each job will have a single point of contact, a lead ESR, to answer questions and resolve installation problems. Both the contractor and the owner will receive automated status updates by email at various points in the process. And finally, coordination between DWP meter installation crews will be significantly improved. Okay, with that, I want to open this up for question and answer. Can we do that now, or is there going to be a bigger Q&A at the end? Okay, uh, I'm told that for the internet, for the interweb, somebody's got to speak into the microphone if they have questions so that they can hear it. So, somebody going to? All right, thank you. I really appreciate that. So, we'll wait a minute, make sure that. All right. So, Danny. I think for both the fast track and for um, the smaller systems that don't need the performance meter, mm -hmm. it, there seems to be an inconsistency between the inverter output. And the, C, and the ACCEC output. 
both in kind of what you guys said and what we've seen on paper. Can okay. you clarify that for okay. both? Again, the it, fast it track. Is, it is, uh, for fast track, it's ACCEC. -C. And for the performance meter? For the performance meter, yeah, you the would solar need, performance. Yeah, you would need a performance meter if it is 10 kilowatts or above. Is that again for CECAC yes. or for the inverter's output? No, CECAC. So in both circumstances. Yeah. So sorry for the lack of clarity. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to confirm on the above 30 kilowatt interconnection that it's still the interconnection agreement has to be approved first at eight weeks and then the engineer will start work and that's eight more weeks no that would work in parallel oh, okay because yeah, yeah. now the engineer won't look at it until the interconnect agreement is approved uh they're going to review it beforehand yeah i know your problem that you're talking about about the length of time it takes for that to happen and some of these things are going to happen in parallel and much quicker than they have before and if they have not, please let me know. Okay, they have not. Okay. I'll All let, right, I'll, this is it. I'll, I'll let you I know. Mean, under the new process. <laughs> Cause, because uh, it, yeah, I understand that some of these have just taken way too long, six months. Yeah, okay. Well, we will definitely have a way for you to contact us, contact the lead ESR, explain that, and then that, that would get to me, and I'll, I'll make sure that we move that along. And some of these will take a long time because they're very large services, like, a, say, a customer station downtown for a high-rise. Those are much more involved, and that may take longer. But it shouldn't for a job that's uh, fairly basic, and it just happens to be over 30, or it happens to be a three-phase small system that an engineer has to review. Yeah, that shouldn't take six months. Yes. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for all of these changes. I think it's going to make life easier for all of us that are in this industry. I just wanted to thank you for all of the hard work that you put into hearing, listening to people, and implementing changes. So I wanted to thank all of you. You guys deserve a big hand of applause for that. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. Secondly, so I'm a little slow, so let me just ask my question. Sure. Um, the new website is for residential only? No. So if it's if it's less than 30 kilowatts and it's commercial, multifamily apartments, I would still go to the, um, the new website, net metering website, and well, no, you, you would not go to the website if it's multi-unit. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If it's, it's an apartment building, which primarily is all we do, mm -hmm. I still would go through Power Clerk for that if it's up to 30 kilowatts, and if it's over 30 kilowatts, then we go the other route. Yeah, if it's, if it's multi-unit and it's under 30, you would send us plans, and then we would create a work request. You wouldn't, the work request would not be created on this online system, but it would be created by the lead ESR or the engineer, depending upon the scope of the project. You'll get a, a work request number back. You can actually find one if you go to that uh, tracking website, and if you put your address in, as long as you get, get a work request number there, then you can start the incentive process. So we won't be using Power Clerk anymore? Oh, yes, you will. We still we still have to go through the process. Yes, if, well, if you want to check, yeah. Oh, for the reservation, <laughs> but for the net meter process and installing, we don't. Yeah, you, you, that, right. They're they're totally separate. Okay. All right. We we are divorced <laughs> <laughs> from one another. Um, good morning. Good morning. Um, I wanted to know if we still have to upload all the final permits, or is that going to be done through building and safety? They're going to be uploading it to queue you guys for metering. No, you through won't power. be uploading any permits no for uploading this process. No, the, the, the only thing that we need to plug in that meter is a building and safety approval, the clearance, which we get from building and safety electronically. So you, you don't have to, we're not going to be tracking permits. That's not going to be part of your process anymore. So all you all we need is a, a release from the building and safety inspector. And how do you get that? Is that after they come and they finalize the yes, permit? Yes, after they uh, okay. do their final inspection and they sign it off in their system, 
Uh, it used to be that they, they would have to fill out a piece of paper and then give it to a clerk who gives it to another clerk, and sometimes uh -huh. it doesn't make it into the computer. Uh -huh. Now it's directly out of their system into ours, okay. which has been an, a recent improvement. Is that the, to say the same for the upgrade panel permit? that goes alongside with the solar? That's going to be uh, combined in one release record. That's the way they're doing it now, in fact. They, they mentioned both the upgrade and the PV system. So it's just one release, and if it's under 10, you're just going to have one meter order that goes out to change the net meter, change it to a net meter. Yeah, should be automatic. If it is not, if, it's, if, if you know that it's been approved and some time has gone by and, and nothing's happening, give us a, a call. Give a call to the connection center number or to the lead ESR contact person. Okay. Yeah, they just implemented the system a couple of weeks ago. And there are some hang-ups we've had. It still requires that the building and safety inspector do some action in their computer that causes this release to come to us. So it's, it's not 100% automatic. There are some issues um, that they're still ironing out. So we get the with an email indicating confirmation the building and safety has, in fact, put in the paperwork yet. You'll get a confirmation when the when the order has gone out, which means we got a building and safety release. So How long does that should be the same day. Once that's assuming that there's no ESR hold on it, and us fast track there wouldn't be. So assume, assuming it's a fast track job, that building and safety release comes in. We have a, a clerk who's dedicated to doing only that, and they should should load it up and and send out that order the same day. Yeah, that would be the same. Yeah, there will be a release that comes over that covers everything. There should be. We're yeah. going to jump to the web. There's probably a handful of questions there. We'll just do a couple sure. over there, and then we'll come back here, and we'll alternate a little bit. Uh, question. Are performance meters required on commercial systems under 10K? No. Okay, that was a quick answer. Let's do one more. <laughs> Does the fast track include microinverters and DC optimized systems? Yes. <laughs> Just do one, one quick. Just, Just keep questions. the easy ones coming, please. <laughs> what will be the difference between a lease and a purchase? There is a question on that web form that I displayed that does, we do ask the question, is this system leased or not? And that goes into our system. But maybe you want to answer some more about that. Yeah, really the, the process in terms of if you're selling systems or you're leasing them is not really going to change uh, after December 4th. So you'll still continue to upload your uh, purchase agreement and you'll still continue to upload what we call the compliance form, the CF form. Uh, so that won't change, but there'll be a it's a checkbox, right, for yes. uh, the installation yeah. uh, and interconnection process. Somebody asked me a tough question uh, on slide. 12, I know Danny will uh, on slide twelve of Jason's presentation. Um, the fast track process has photos that are submitted to the ESR, and then the contractor builds the system. Yes. When you were going through the website, you were submitting pictures of a finished system. Can you explain the difference? Oh, the pictures that I uploaded? Yeah. What, well, that what was, was that a, process versus what's your process? There's a kind of a okay. Well, the the, the pictures that I grabbed were just for uh, file upload sake. They, they, weren't, they weren't necessarily accurate to show this is a system that hasn't been built yet. I just grabbed any photos I could this morning. Right. But. Basically, you upload pictures of the service prior to installation right. when you uh, submit your request. So, so that's kind of a new step that hasn't been there before, where ESR was that are residential. Mm -hmm. It kind of holds the process for moving forward until we get to see something. That's Is correct. There a reason why that new step? Yes, because. The reason for that, Danny, is that a lot of these orders were going out to field crews 
blindly. By that I mean that nobody looked at anything. And what's happening is that when construction, who's the first employee from DWP arrived, to look at the service, there were problems problems that would cause them to have to leave the job and come back, which causes delays and ex extra expense for DWP. For example, there's a service drop there that was deteriorated and other, or the attachment is, is falling down. Uh, if we see that, normally we would go out as ESRs, anything else residential, we would go out and look at it and provi provide what's called a meter spot. We assess not only where the new system is supposed to go, but also our distribution system, make sure there are no problems. So the, the reason for this, and this is, again, like San Diego Gas and Electric, they asked for the same thing. This, this saves us time because uh, we can review it without necessarily sending somebody out, and also we can avoid a lot of problems that would be handed off to the field crews. Hi. Hi. So my questions are all going to stem from the fact that I never see any of these properties. I never touch any of the equipment. I never meet the customer. Mm -hmm. And that's probably true for most everybody who's going to be working with this system. Um, so you have uh, something asked for here in the photos of a photo of the service riser attachment and weather head. Mm -hmm. Can you show me what that is? Because if I turn and ask somebody for it and I don't know what it is in the first place, yeah. That's hard. And by the way, you don't have to do this. If you if you are not going to be getting photos on the site uh, of the site and you you don't have those handy, you could just opt to go to the standard process. And then that that would be an interconnection agreement and a single line diagram of of the system. If you don't have the um, the system set up to go out and and take pictures of the site. Okay. Um I have more. Sure. Yeah. So we, I still don't know what that thing looks like. Okay. Now, as far as the uh, – the, it is the pipe that extends above the roof uh, where the wires come down from the pole and connect on this pipe. That, that's, the, that's the overhead feed. Thank you. Um, and I'm gathering that all information needs to be ready before we go into this because I'm not seeing that I'm typing in any customer information. I'm simply uploading documents. Well, yeah, that was on that uh, form, and I, I'm sorry I kind of blazed through that, but there was a, a place there to put both the contractors and and, cus uh, and the customers' information into the form. So can I pause and come back to this if I don't happen to have oh, a photo sure. or something? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, in fact, that's why we kind of warn you more than once at the beginning that you'll need these things, and if you don't have it, you actually can't finish until you upload those files. Okay, thank you. Um, then there was a page that listed a bunch of questions, and I would love to have access to those questions before I leave. Um, they were like overhead or underground, existing uh, service, I guess, or something, locked gate, dog, battery back, TV. Mm -hmm. Those are just my notes, but I would need to have all that information and give it to the salesperson so that when they get back to the office, all those questions are answered. I'm sure we can get you those questions. I mean, if you want to email me, I'm alex.roberts at ladwp.com, and I can provide you, you know, uh, copies of the handout or this or anything else you need. Okay. If we've already submitted something um, and it's a rebate that's confirmed, then we go to a, uh, the NEM portal and find our work request number. Is that correct? Well, you'll get an email that has the work request number in it. And, and instructions and some hyperlinks on how to track the progress online. Okay. And if this is um, an expanded system, we go with the long form, which is off this? No, it's not off this. It's just standard. Like if someone has an existing system and we're going to expand it, add. Uh, yeah. I, I, if, it depends upon uh, the output of the, of the total system, if it's over 30 kW then it would be a long form. But if the, the entire output of all the systems combined, new and old, is below 30, that would be standard process. But not fast track? Possibly, depending upon the scope. Okay. And standard is with a single line diagram? Yeah. Usually on, on larger systems, it, it, uh, the fast track is mainly for residential systems, which is, which is the vast majority. 
Okay. And doesn't sound like the NEM agreements have changed at all. We're using the same form. Yes. Okay. I think I'm done. Okay. <laughs> For a project we have a confirmation on now that's not going to get energized until after the 4th, will we need the work request number or will we get it automatically or or what? Okay. So you've got a project that is in the power clerk status, confirm reservation today and you want to know what you should do next in a sense. Yeah, after the 4th. So you won't have to do anything different except for after the 4th you'll get in contact with uh, the connection center uh, and then request that meter after you have uh, billing and safety final. And then once that happens, you go back into Power Clerk and the work request number will already be populated. That field will already be populated. If it's not, there's a link to how to look it up and it'll, that link will just push you exactly to the page where you punch in the address, look it up, and then you plug that in. Okay. So again, in short, it should be there. If it's not, you'll have a way to look it up. Do you have anything to add to that one? Nope. Okay. Um, currently, there's a lot of issues with names on paperwork. Is any of that changing um, to be a little bit more lenient, or are you guys still going to be as strict as you are in the name format? So to add more clarity to that and maybe put it more bluntly, if the name currently today for interconnection agreements doesn't perfectly match the bill, meaning if there's a middle initial on the interconnection agreement, but there's no middle initial on the bill, it's currently not accepted. And so you're asking, is there going to be any flexibility there to allow that? Um, I would say now is probably the opportunity to build that flexibility in, but I can't speak uh, to that specifically except to say that when we work with the city attorney's office, th these are the sort of regulations that we've got to uh, abide by. Um, so there might be some flexibility in the yeah. future going forward. Alex, I don't know if you well, want to speak initially, to Initially, we're basically adopting your process with regard to interconnection agreement review, and uh, we're applying the same rules, but, but we would have to check with uh, management and city attorney's office to make sure yeah. we can uh, loosen some of these requirements, yeah. make it a little easier. I, I would love to as well. I, I just don't know if we can commit to that quite yet, but we will absolutely look into it and see if we can push that. Yeah, so they'll have to match, um, but the level of scrutiny on the reservation request is not at the same yeah. level as the interconnection agreement. You've probably noticed that. And so that criteria won't change for the uh, reservation process. But again, yeah, we will look into uh, what sort of flexibility we so can you, build in. And I'm not sure of this. You're not going to be reviewing the interconnection agreements anymore, but you're, you're just going to simply you have to verify that it's been approved by us. Yeah, we'll verify that it's approved yeah. by by uh, you guys. Okay. Yeah, and we'll we'll provide some clarity on that, guys. Let's make sure we make a note of that, and we'll include that with a lot more detail on on how to proceed and and what sort of variations might be might be allowed. Uh, Yeah. That that I can confirm will be easier. Because you, you you can basically call us and get that resolved. Get that resolved with the lead ESR contact person. By the way, you find your lead ESR by going to the find the right person website, and you just uh, that's www.ladwp.com forward slash find the right person, all one word, and you look up that person and give them a call. And we can resolve these issues. I think you'll find they'll be resolved much more quickly. Okay, I'm going to jump to the web and get a couple okay. more questions over here. Uh, what happens when cookie cutter 10 kW residential job and a 10.1 kW cookie cutter residential job that automatically warrants the ESR having to visit the site twice? 
in addition to the meter tech? Or, uh... Okay, the question is about if the thing is 10 or 10.1, do you need an ESR? The answer is yes. I, I also think there, the question might be alluding to what if when they apply and they submit an interconnection agreement at the very front, at the beginning of the process, yes. and they say it's 9.8, and they find out oh, I can get one more panel on there and it's a little over 10, how will that change for them? Well, if they start out initially with under 10 and then things change, it would probably move it into the, the standard process. Okay. But they wouldn't have to take any action? No. Okay. But it, we would have to be notified some way. Right. It okay. change. Okay. I, and if we're not told, we may. Um, I, I don't know if you're not if you're not telling us that information. I'm not sure how we would know that because yeah. you're just applying once in the beginning. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If you need if you need to adjust the plan and say something like this happens where it's suddenly over 10, then again, you would contact your lead ESR. Uh, person and let them know that the system has changed. We may ask for a single line diagram in that case. Yes, they do. Uh, what kind of change do, are we talking about? I mean the the, um, the number of panels. Yeah, and then the output could change. Yeah. Well, it would be this, like you said, if it if it suddenly becomes over 10, then it would be, uh, we need updated information. Oh, as far as uh, DWP goes, all we're doing is plugging in a net meter and making sure that there's uh, a switch there. Uh, but building and safety is, is going to do the inspection on these. If it's a below 10, it's a fast track, there's no ESR inspection. So bu building and safety will be responsible for verifying. And all those things. To just add a little bit to that, we also have that opportunity in PowerClear to make those revisions as well. And so for the vast majority of applications, 99.9%, .9 we'll have really detailed uh, system information um, there. Okay. I'm just going to do a couple more on the web and then we'll come back to you. After we get the reservation, then we immediately submit for an NEM work order number? Actually, the other way around. You get the work request number first, and then you go to the reservation system in Power Clerk. Do a couple of your legal errors. Um, at then at the tail end, when we go into Power Clerk, all we need to put in is the IP form from the client, that's it, right? The incentive claim form at the tail end when you want to submit for a reservation. Um, I'm going to let the expert answer that one. Okay, that was one question. And then I had a question in respect to non-incentive. Uh, difference between uh, major renovation to new construction, but to non-incentive, uh, non what format do you work with? Power clerk doesn't seem to be the right format. Um, how do you, and it's a residential, but it's a non-incentive because it's a new construction, and that might not meet the Title 24 requirements that you guys have. Yeah, as, as far as uh, no incentive jobs, when you start, we're, we're not dealing with incentives at all in, in service planning. So if you're not going to apply for that, it, it won't change on our side. So you won't need to go into Power Clerk. So if yeah. you've got a system and you know it's not eligible for an incentive for whatever reason, or if you just don't want an incentive for whatever reason, you just go through the interconnection process yeah. and then you get energized that way and you never have to touch Power Clerk for that job. Yeah. Meaning this right-hand side of this flow chart. Yeah. Yep, that's right. Yeah, we have, we have almost nothing to do with the incentive process at all. So it, it doesn't matter to us whether you want to apply for an incentive or not. So commercial systems, multifamily apartment buildings, over 30 kilowatts with the long form interconnection, is there any change in terms of currently we submit two originals to Judy Rolls' office? Is that still the same for now? That will continue. Yeah, I hear that there is a easier process in the works coming. 
2016. But for now, it's exactly the same. Okay. Did you still have a question? You've been waiting a while. Yeah. All right, Danny, give me a tough one. <laughs> I had a ESR for a commercial system. Mm -hmm. Turn the system on while we were still waiting for the meter. Um, is there a reason why that's not possible for the residential jobs? Normally, we don't turn the service on at all. That, that is usually done by a construction, and they don't necessarily throw the switch. They just install the meter. They do some testing, but we, we generally do not energize the services. Now, in the, in the case of a fast track, we won't be going out to the site at all, so we couldn't do it on those. On the larger ones, um, why don't you give me an email and we'll talk about This guy may have just been really nice to me because we were waiting a long time. Yeah. So That's not the norm. I, I guess is there a reason why we have to wait for that net the new net meter to take to to replace the existing one or the the old mechanical Well, one of the one matter. of the reasons I can give you several, but one of the reasons why you don't want to turn a PV system on when you don't have a net meter is the kind of meter that's in there, so the standard meter it cannot run backwards. In fact, it'll continue to run forward faster, and the customer will get a big whopping bill if we turn the system on and they don't have a net meter. So that's one of the main reasons why we shouldn't energize it until there's a net meter. Well, old mechanical meters do spin backwards. They do, but we have very few of those anymore. The new ones are all digital, and as an anti-theft measure, uh, you, know, you used to be able to take a meter, a mechanical meter, turn it upside down, and they would steal power that way. Uh, now these are incapable of running backwards. They only run forward. Um, uh, for, the, for the new process when the incentive is waiting for DWP's meter to proceed, mm -hmm. is there a reason why it can't be DBS's sign-off that triggers the um, the next step in the incentive process so that the installers aren't waiting for for DWP for both processes? Uh, the part of the meter installation process is the construction crew will come out and they will test the output to make sure that it, it matches what was claimed, what the incentive claim paperwork said. So they, there's, it's necessary for them to go out and verify that before the incentive payment is issued. And my final question is sure. um, to, to Jason's slide number four. In 2018, customer net metering stops. So for anyone in this room who does residential commercial solar in Los Angeles, they'll basically be out of a job. Is there a reason why DWP's uh, viewpoint is that there will not be any more net metering in the city of Los Angeles at that point, which is about which is only two years away. I'll answer that one. Thanks. That's a great question. The question is, the slice of our solar future is growing until it gets to 310 and then it stops. And just for some context of why that is in our integrated resource plan the way it is, is that's based on a criteria that the state used to use to determine the cap for net metering, which was 5% of your load. And so they've gone, uh, the investor-owned utilities have changed their policy. We list this as it projects out to 310 but we do not have a cap as it stands today. We don't plan to, in 2018, if we get to 311 megawatts, we do not plan to uh, discontinue the program. So we haven't said what a cap would be or anything like that. We're doing a lot of studies on our distribution system, but as it stands today, we have no plans to stop this program once we get to 310. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. So I just want to clarify something. Maybe I misheard, but um, I thought I heard you say that within 90 days of the meter being installed, you would want to, us to submit an incentive claim form. But I don't know how to track 90 days with an incentive claim form. Like I know I could, I know 90 days from meter I could start the process, yeah, but like you will get an email when the meter's installed. Okay. And then, then you know the clock has started. And then you would go over to uh, Power Clerk and complete that part, right? Right. Yeah. We probably need to start it when we start everything. So you could answer that a little more in detail. So the question was, how do, how do you know when that 90 days uh, timer is on, right? How do you know and how do you track that? What's the easy way to track that? 
Right. Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll clarify that for you. So basically, once you get a reservation, you start again, you start with the interconnection process. You go to the new website, uh, you submit your request, you get your work request number, and then you go into Power Clerk and fill out your application for a incentive reservation. You, do, you start with net metering. Yep, exactly. And then you'll get an instantaneous confirmation for residential systems. And then once you actually you know, build the system, permit it, and work with service planning to get that meter installed, then from the date that that meter is installed, and again, you'll get an automatic no notification to the customer and to the contractor when that meter is installed. And if it's not that same day, it'll be the, the very next day. And so we have an internal um, system where we see that record and we look that up to see if you submit your request for payment within 90 days of that. So you have that email that comes to you, and then you'll know from that point on you've got 90 days to submit your request, uh, submit your incentive payment request. They don't really want to wait to start. You don't. You, 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 you'd probably want to do it right after you uh, have the meter installed. There, there would be really, right, really the only reason to wait, and I, I don't know this, you guys all know this, uh, I would presume the only reason to wait would be you haven't, secured all the signatures with the customer for whether it's the IP form or something like that. Other than that, I can't see why you'd want to wait to ask for the rebate. And again, with the program unwinding and, you know, by the end of the 2016 and in 2017, when there are no incentives, we don't want new requests coming in, you know, mid-2017 and 2018 saying, I got a system in 2016, I want a rebate now. So we want to put, we built in a little bit of flexibility. We hope 90 days is enough. Um, and if it's not, if for whatever reason, if there's something that we didn't think about and that 90 days isn't enough, we want to hear why. Sure. How long do we have from confirmation until finalizing? Like now it's six months from confirmation until we can build the system. And so I've had a lot of clients that wanted to reserve it in July and try to install it towards the end of the year and just so you know why, so they can get their tax credits obviously come January, February, so they're not out so much. Is the six months still going to be applicable? Is there that flexibility? Or are we done with that? No, this, this is the one thing that will be entirely different. It will be that process will be much much shorter. So when you you get a, a, an email that says that the interconnection agreement is approved, that also means that the ESR has reviewed the system. That means you're good to go. You can start. That could happen in a few days. Oh, I see. Is there, yeah, is there so an expiration? There is as an expiration. As far as we're concerned, there isn't, but it, there may be yeah. for you. So I think the question is, is that six-month reservation time for a residential uh, non-new construction, is that still going to be six months? And the answer is yeah. So if you wanted to figure out a way to extend that, if you have problems permitting it and you can document that and send that to us, there's still going to be the uh, time extension request form. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Now, if you were you know, you weren't sure on the timing, you could conceivably start the interconnection process and then wait to apply for uh, an incentive. When you do that, you take a little bit of risk that maybe will step down um, and, right. or maybe if it was late 2016, oh, there might yeah. be limited funds left. If we're reserving until six months, we're going to be on the that's correct, yeah. So there is still a six-month reservation uh, expiration time frame for uh, residential. One year for commercial. Correct, and yes, one year for commercial. Okay. Let's do a couple more from the web. Can you explain the benchmark report? Not sure what they're referring to. I'll let the expert handle that. Yeah, the benchmark report. Um, they might be res uh, asking about the commercial energy efficiency. Yeah, um, yeah. There's an energy efficiency requirement that's listed in our uh, incentive guidelines, and I don't personally know a lot of the details about what goes into it, but um, we could probably publish some clarification on that if we need to, or at least point out the section that uh, that that's discussed in our guidelines. So I, I don't really have much to say on that. Okay. Is the email confirming that the meter is installed the PTO notice, meaning we can turn on the system on once the meters are installed? Yes. 
once that, that email goes out, it says the meter has been installed. That's the same thing as a permission to operate. No, they don't turn the system. They do install the meter, but the uh, AC disconnect switch, I believe, is left in the open position. They'll let the customer or the contractor turn that on. They turn it on. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, they are turning it on. Yeah, if there's any change, if there's any change. Sorry that, about that. We'll, uh, I, had heard, I had heard otherwise, but uh, that, that's something that part of the process we don't see. Uh, the construction crews, they, I, I had heard that they were not going to turn those on. Going forward, you're saying they're not, but they haven't. Okay, then I haven't heard of any change. So I think, I think you're correct that they do turn them on, and they should tell us if there's any major change in procedure. Yes. No. Well, yes, yeah, there is some talk to changing it. It's because some utilities no longer require that. We still do. Now, the access uh, requirements to that AC disconnect has changed, but we still need the switch. Okay. Um, it used to be you, you had to have 24-7 access to all utility disconnect switches. That means that if there wasn't a gate that was accessible at the property, even if it's a residential small system, we would ask you to put in a gate. Uh, so this is no longer the case. Yeah, reasonable access. That's a good way of putting it. Or um, readily accessible. Okay, we can do a few more questions. And then again, for anybody online that submitted a question that we did not answer, we'll again publish that uh, and then post it on our website. So let's do a few more. Real quick, so with the new system, there will be an email notification when PTO was granted. Currently, there's not. The answer is yes. Yep. There will be an email that says that you have permission to operate. Yeah. Although. From what I'm hearing, they've already turned it on for you, <laughs> but you, you'll get an email that says that you have permission to operate. Yeah. In the previous um, SIP guidelines, if any applicant submitted three deficient applications, they were they were barred from using the program for three months. Um, for for from my standpoint, the best thing about what you guys are doing right now is instantaneous reservations for the incentive. Um, but that also makes it really easy for um, an installer to just press submit, submit, submit for tons of projects. Are you considering revisiting that and you know, um, looking at you know their project default rate? Also, you know, since you mentioned the commercial default rate has been higher than expected, um, and that does you know make it difficult for other projects to get in the queue that will get built. So is that being considered at all? So to address the first point you brought up, um, uh, the deficiencies, uh, as you noted, if you get three of them, uh, an applicant would be barred from participating in the program for a period of time. To date, we haven't had to bar anybody from the program. Most of the time, 99% of the time, you know, we get good information. Uh, occasionally, some people upload like blank PDFs just to fulfill that, and that's not acceptable. They're just trying to get the incentive as quick as they can, and they're not really ready, and maybe somebody behind them in line is ready, so we want to prevent that from happening. Um, going forward, that won't really change, but you're right. There is a little bit of extra risk on the applicant uh, to submit the correct information. And so what we don't want to have happen is somebody upload five, six blank PDFs, get an instantaneous reservation. They'll have to reconcile all of that at the later stage if they do upload something like that, and they still would be eligible to get a deficiency if they were to do that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, so you, you would obviously want to check it with the bill first. Um, and then if, okay, yeah, yeah, if there is a discrepancy, you'll have the opportunity to remedy that at the second stage. So you will still have that opportunity. It'll just happen later. Again, the key here is to not have any of those fixes 
hold up the interconnection process. We just we want to get that taken care of as, yeah. as quickly. Well, as we do have a review process, and they are kicked back, as you as it were. But this is yet again another auto reply email that goes out. When the reviewer looks at the interconnection agreement, there's something that's askew. They hit a button, and this sends an email back to the requester saying that, that there's a problem with the interconnection agreement. So this this should happen fairly quickly, within a week, I would think. Any last questions? Any comments from any folks from DWP that would like to add anything that we should share? Okay, so um, thank you. Oh, we got one more question. I have a question. In respect to the VBSR, the the mic. Find the right yeah. I'm sorry. Um, in respect to the lead ESR, finding the right person, is that going to be um, a phone number that's accessing a person? Or is that going to be an email? Is that going to be a phantom email? Well, you'll what have the option. You have several options. The, if you call this number, they're usually going to be out in the field during the day. So if you can wait, you can leave them a message. Better is calling the connection center. The connection center, you will get a person within a few minutes, and, and you won't have to wait on hold for a half hour, hour. Usually, you'll get in in under five minutes, and you'll get to somebody who can help you. That's 213 in power. That's... I think it's listed on both presentations yeah. as well. And in digits, that's 213 367 the uh, inspector, the lead ESR, has an email address listed on Find the Right Person as well. You can also send an email to the solar coordinator. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you to everybody on the web uh, for their participation. We had uh, nearly 150 people uh, dial in and, and view the presentation. We'll post this uh, afterwards on our website. Um, we'll, I believe we have the ability to post it with the audio, so you can go back and um, you know, listen to all the questions and all of that. Um, I want to thank my team for uh, the hard work over the last uh, several months uh, in making these programmatic changes. Um, Alex, for his uh, thank you, Alex, for his leadership on getting things uh, done with DBS and and staffing up and uh, really driving these improvements. And then the efficiency solutions team for uh, really handling this massive increase that we've had over the last several weeks and still maintaining really great reservation times. So uh, the customer service folks as well. Um, and finally, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for your continued constructive feedback and for attending. And again, sorry we did this on a Monday morning, but this was the time that worked out for uh, everybody. So again, thank you again for attending. And uh, if you have any further questions, please email us and we'll publish the responses online. Thanks. Thank you all.